Hello, saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody's doing well today. 2 Timothy 2.15, of course, we know Paul tells Timothy a very important statement here, a very important verse for us to look at and study and keep in mind every time we read and we study God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, the word of truth and the word of truth of course is God's word 66 books of the Bible the King James Version Bible now perhaps one of the most misunderstood confusing controversial and abused verses in God's word is 2nd Thessalonians 2 chapter 2 one of the contributing factors of course are the new versions of the Bible the corrupted versions of God's word and one thing I've learned throughout studying God's word is that Whenever you see the enemy change a particular section of scripture, the alarm bells should be going off. And for me, these alarm bells are screaming and pay close attention to these changes and notice how these changes affect the meaning of God's truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2, when not changed, when rightly divided and studied out, confirms without a doubt that the harpots are the gathering of the body of Christ the rapture is in fact prior to Daniel's 70th week no wonder why the enemy wants to change this right it makes a whole lot of sense when you take a look at the big picture so let us look at what Paul has to say here in 2nd Thessalonians 2 and may this study comfort us and also be of comfort to somebody watching this video that has been concerned over this particular verse in scripture over the rapture and the 70th week of Daniel especially considering where considering where we're at today in the big scheme of things right second Thessalonians 2 we read in verse 1 now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. In verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time Firstly, I want to show you how the corrupted versions have changed things in some of these verses and how these changes impact the meaning of what Paul was talking about. In looking at several of the corrupted versions, I'm talking about the NIV, the ESV, the ASV, and all the Vs, and so on, is that they all change something in verse 2. They change the phrase day of Christ to the day of the Lord now at first glance it might not seem like it's a big deal but it is a big deal because this particular change is what causes much of the confusion and misunderstanding of what Paul was actually explaining to the Thessalonians in 2nd Thessalonians 2 in the NIV New International Version a corrupted version we read concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him we ask you brothers and sisters not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter asserting that the day of the Lord has already come don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed in the ASV American Standard Version now we beseech you brethren touching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him to the end that ye be not quickly shaken from your mind 
nor yet be troubled, either by spirit, or by word, or by epistle, as from us, as that the day of the Lord is just at hand. Let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be except the falling away comes first, and the man of sin be revealed, and so on. Now, in the New American Standard Bible, we read, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit, or a message, or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Isn't it interesting they use the word apostasy? Where does that word apostasy come from? If you remember in our studies, they use the word apostasy here, which is a uh, the same, it is a translation from the Greek word apostasia, which translates over to the real phrase that comes from the King James Version Bible that Paul wrote, the falling away. So even they get it. Now, in another corrupted version, ESV, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay, so let's look at a few things here, especially anything that's been changed, okay, or removed from the King James Version to the new corrupted versions. Remember earlier I said, pay attention to what the enemy changes or removes or adds and how it impacts the original meaning of the King James Version Bible. These are clues, very important clues. The enemy isn't doing these things because he's bored. There, there's a reason why he's making these changes, as we'll see in this study. The first significant change that we see, which seems to be the common denominator with all the new corrupted versions, is in verse 2. Looking at verse 1 again in our real Bible, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, comma, verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. They all use the day of the Lord is at hand. But here, in the King James Version Bible, Paul writes, that the day of Christ is at hand. Is this, is this a mistake? The first significant change they all make is the phrase day of Christ. They change it to the day of the Lord, as if both mean the same thing. But they don't. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord are not the same thing. Each event is for a specific time period, and each event is for two very different distinct groups of people as we're going to see so the first thing we need to do is define the phrase day of christ right what is what was paul talking about how did paul use the phrase day of christ what did he mean in his writings regarding this specific period of time look at it, philippians 1 10 that ye may approve things that are excellent that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Philippians 2.16 Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain. 1 Corinthians 1.8 We shall all confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6 being confident in this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now notice the phrase day of Christ, day of Jesus Christ, day of our Lord Jesus Christ 
is only found in Paul's books. It's not found outside of Paul's writings. So that right there is a very significant clue for those of us who appreciate right division. It would seem at this point that the day of Christ is significant only to the body of Christ inside the dispensation of grace. Second thing we notice is that Paul describes the day of Christ as something good, something we're all to look forward to. And never, never does Paul ever say that the day of Christ is a time of wrath or judgment or something that the body of Christ is to fear or be concerned about in a negative way. Another important clue for us. So there seems to be a contradiction between how Paul describes the day of Christ and how the counterfeiter describes the day of Christ. And we know in other videos that I've made concerning seeming contradiction within God's word that there are no contradictions in the King James Version Bible, just indicators that we need to look into those things a bit closer. We need to study them out to understand what's taking place. So this seeming contradiction is a big red flag. And it so happens to be that the one thing that causes people to misunderstand what Paul is saying here in 2 Thessalonians 2. Let's move over to the phrase day of the Lord, which is the counterfeit versions of the, the counterfeit versions use the day of the Lord, right? They're changing the day of Christ to the day of the Lord. Why are they doing that? Let's see what the day of the Lord is in the King James Version of the Bible. And let's see if the counterfeiter is using the phrase correctly or incorrectly. All right. The day of the Lord occurs 370 in 370 verses in the King James. We can't look at all of them today, but we need to look at least at a few of them to get the context of what the phrase day of the Lord actually means and also for who it's referencing. Notice in particular another major clue here that the phrase day of the Lord is only found outside of Paul's books, outside of the body of Christ, outside of the dispensation of grace, outside of the mystery gospel of the grace of God. And it is only found in reference to the prophetic program, the prophetic administration, the, the, their dispensation in reference to Israel, especially in reference to unbelievers outside of the body of Christ. So, for those of us, the students of right division, according to 2 Timothy 2.15, the Holy Spirit reveals to us the difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord by revealing to us that each phrase is particular to different administrations. Prophecy versus mystery in this case. Let's take a look at a few verses that contain the phrase, day of the Lord. Isaiah 2.12. Now, ask yourself, as we read these, does the day of the Lord sound like a happy time, like Paul described the day of Christ? Is it a time to be joyful and look forward to? Let's find out. Isaiah 2.12 For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Isaiah 13.6 Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. 13.9 Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Doesn't sound like a good time so far. Ezekiel 13.5 Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Joel 1.15 Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Joel 2.1 Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Pay particular attention to this next verse. Notice, Joel says, the Lord come. 
speaking of the second coming within the day of the Lord. Okay? Joel 2.31 The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Now, remember that verse because there's a very significant correlation between Joel 2.31 and that counterfeit letter that Paul was speaking about in our study today in 2 Thessalonians 2. The phrase I want you to remember is this. The terrible day of the Lord come. Okay? We're going to go back to that later. It's going to be very important. Another verse to keep in mind is this next one. Malachi 4.5 Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In Acts 2.20 if you recall that particular verse in our study in Acts, Peter was quoting what we just read. The verse that I said was important to remember. Peter is quoting Joel in Joel 2.31. In Acts 2.20, Peter says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. When? Before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Notice. The phrase again, the notable day of the Lord come. This is in reference to the second coming. When Jesus comes with his army of angels to gather unbelievers, taking them to judgment. It's not a party. It's a very, very bad day. The notable day of our Lord come is an event that takes place within the day of the Lord. One is the event of the second coming. The other is a period of 1,000 years beginning with Daniel's 70th week. It's important to distinguish these terms. So at this point, the puzzle should be coming together for some of you. Let's take a look at Joel 2 once again. Joel 2.31 The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So is Joel talking about the 1,000 year period of the day of the Lord here? Or is Joel talking about the second coming when Jesus comes back to the earth in wrath and judgment? Joel is talking about the day Jesus comes back with his army of angels to pour out his wrath and judgment upon the wicked. Joel is talking about an event at the end of Daniel's 70th week when the day of the Lord has already been taking place for seven years now. Okay, remember, the day of the Lord begins with Daniel's 70th week. The day of the Lord come is an event within the day of the Lord. It is when Jesus comes back with his army of angels, warring angels, represented by white horses, means he's coming back in fierce wrath and judgment and destruction. The great and terrible day of the Lord come. Another verse to look at here, Paul is talking about those people who will remain on the earth for Daniel's 70th week. Talking about outside of the dispensation of grace, remember. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Here, Paul is talking about a 1,000 year period. The day of the Lord. The hour no man knoweth. And one more verse, 2 Peter 3, 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Question. Does the earth pass away at the second coming of Jesus? Or does the earth pass away at the end of 1,000 years when God creates a new earth and a new heaven? Notice, Peter says, that the ending of the 1,000 years is also included in the day of the Lord, which confirms that the day of the Lord is a 1,000 year period. Again, beginning with Daniel's 70th week. So at this point, we've seen examples of how the phrase day of the Lord, the day of the Lord come, the great notable terrible, I'm paraphrasing here, the terrible day of the Lord come, is talking about the return of Jesus Christ. In flaming anger, wrath, judgment with an army of angels who only have one particular job at that moment and it's not a party. 
So, again, we've seen examples of how the phrase of the day of the Lord come is talking about the return of Jesus Christ compared to the, the day of the Lord signifying a period of time going as long as a thousand years, right? But still, we also see how the day of Christ is very different than the day of the Lord come or the day of the Lord. Three very different events for different groups of people. Understanding that, we go back to 2 Thessalonians 2 in our study. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. <clears throat> now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now in verse 1, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him is a reference to the harpazo the real day of Christ the head our Lord Jesus claiming his body the Saints the members the building unto himself this is the rapture in verse 2 that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled notice the contrast here the seeming contradiction recall that Paul taught that the day of Christ was a time of joy a happy moment for us a time to rejoice referencing our gathering the harpazo so why would the Thessalonians be shaken in mind or troubled by this the answer is in the rest of the verse neither by spirit a reference to the minister or the teacher comma nor by word is a reference to what the teacher has to say or is saying or teaching okay nor by letter a reference to scripture written by the teacher or minister pay close attention to the rest of the verse as from us notice the simile here Paul is indicating that someone was counterfeiting Paul's writings pretending to have the word or teaching of Paul in documented form again another simile as that the day of Christ is at hand the false teacher was going around teaching that the day of Christ was not what Paul taught as a good day for the body of Christ but that he was teaching the day of Christ was in fact the great and notable day of our Lord come the second coming when he comes with wrath and judgment with his army of war angels hence the reason why now do you understand why the Thessalonians were so shaken up and troubled they thought Paul changed his teaching or understanding or teaching about what the day of Christ was that there was no rapture or gathering and they were about to face a time of tribulation and wrath included at the second coming and we continue on in verse 3 which explains this even further let no man deceive you by any means for that day what day that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition let no man deceive you by any means for that day which day Paul is referencing what the counterfeiter was teaching that the great and notable day of our Lord come the great wrath and judgment of the second coming Paul says that day shall not come except then Paul goes over the details of Daniel's 70th week what he taught the Thessalonians previously that day shall not come except there come a falling away I've taught you all about the falling away in many other videos if you remember it's the apostasia even one of the counterfeit versions calls it the apostasy they almost get it right they almost understand it but not quite it's the apostasy when Israel will forsake Moses' teachings and follow the deception caused by the delusion that God allows and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition speaking the Antichrist here inside of Daniel's 70th week second Thess 2 4 who opposeth and exalteth himself it, he, Paul's explaining the Antichrist above all that is called God or that is worship so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God 
Now, when does the Antichrist sit in the temple and proclaim himself to be God? Well, we know it's at the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Then Paul continues moving forward to the end of Daniel's 70th week. Notice Paul describes the beginning, the middle, and the ending of the 70th week. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Paul taught them all about the gathering, then Daniel's 70th week, and then the second coming, the great and notable day of the Lord come. In verse 6, Paul declares that now a new mystery is revealed to them. Now they know that something is holding the Antichrist from having power on the earth and being revealed. Paul continues on explaining further concerning what's holding back this Antichrist in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Something needs to be taken out of the way first. Verse 8, And then, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, and signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them. Who's the them here? These are the ones on earth after the rapture. They are on earth at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. What does God do? And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Well, what is this delusion going to cause? What is it going to, what is this deception going to create? The result of believing this lie, this deception, is what causes the apostasia, the apostasia, the falling away, the forsaking of what Israel had been taught, the teachings of Moses. They, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, but we are bound to give thanks always. To God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel. Which gospel might this be? This is the gospel of the grace of God, the mystery, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. In verse 15, Paul says, Stand fast, hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word, which is the preaching of the minister, what Paul preached, or epistle, what Paul wrote in scripture on paper. He's telling them to make sure they're not deceived by false teachers and false teaching whether by what they say or anything they have to write. In verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you. Establish is to make you stable in all ways, you in every good work and uh, word and work. And you'll notice at the end of 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul signs off by enforcing the fact that he signed each of his 13 books with his signature to authenticate it as being from him. Security measures against any further attempts of what just happened, what just took place here. Any attempts from false teachers to deceive the body of Christ. Paul now says he will sign all his epistles. Make sure that you notice his signature. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 17, The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. A token being a seal of proof, his signature of proof that the letter is from Paul. To concentrate 
all of this in are a conclusion, if you will, that Thessalonians received a counterfeit letter saying that it was officially from Paul, that the day of Christ was actually the, se the second coming, okay? This is the great notable day of the Lord here. And they were not going to be raptured up. This, of course, troubled them greatly. And it would even trouble us today, would it not? And there's even false teaching out there that's teaching exactly what this false counterfeit teacher was trying to tell the body of Christ 2,000 years ago. We still have it today. Paul addresses this confusion by distinguishing the difference between the day of Christ versus the second coming. Paul had taught them all about this previously, explaining to them that the second coming couldn't take place unless the falling away, the Antichrist would be revealed and so on, which hadn't happened. So Paul says, look, none of these things have taken place. I taught you guys this stuff. So the second coming cannot be at hand. The great notable day of the Lord cannot be at hand, which this idiot over here calls the day of Christ. The counterfeiter doesn't even know the difference between the day of Christ, the notable day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord. He didn't notice, he didn't know the difference, you see? And now you know what is holding all these things from taking place. First the rapture, then the deception, the falling away, then the revealing of the Antichrist, then the destruction of the Antichrist at the second coming. Secondly, the problem with the corrupt versions of the Bible is they don't distinguish between the great and notable day of our Lord come, the second coming, and the day of the Lord. You see, and this confuses people. If you read the new corrupt versions, they make it look like the day of the Lord happens after Daniel's 70th week. They don't include the 70th week within the 1,000 year period. And that causes all kinds of confusion and false teaching, such as post-tribulation rapture, calling the falling away the rapture or departure, and so on. The list is long, as you all know. You see, there's the day of the Lord, 1,000 years, and there's the day of our Lord come, the second coming. Paul taught that first, the day of joy, a time to look forward to what would happen, the day of Christ, our gathering up to him. The judgment seat of Christ is a joyous event for us. We're looking forward to that. Nothing to be shaken up about. Then Paul goes on and explains the day of the Lord when it would begin. The day of the Lord begins. Seven years later, the second coming, our Lord come. Then 993 years later, the end of the day of the Lord with the creation of of the new earth and the new heaven and uh, the, you know before that the great white throne judgment which is for all unbelievers who died previously throughout time so in closing we've seen another example of why we should not doubt the accuracy of the King James Version Bible why we should understand right division according to 2 Timothy 2.15 and how seeming contradictions are not contradictions but they are indicators that we need to study that particular subject even further to understand what it truly means. Amen? I pray this has been edifying to somebody out there. Unto Christ Jesus be all the glory, power, honor, and praise forever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. Ooh.